Welcome, it's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richie, good to be with you. We got a lot of show today. Breaking down news of the day, my contributor will be Jordan Yule, Rebel HQ contributor and host of Deep Dive, which is on Twitch. Yes, also in the bullpen, I have Mr. Daniel Contreras, commentator Young Voices. We're gonna talk about this fascination that Tucker Carlson and others have with supporting Russia and Russia now obviously supporting Tucker. Should be an interesting debate. Top story of the day. This is a story we reported on when it happened. A known KKK leader was seeking office in Georgia. And according to the locals, he was the favorite to win. I now have an update to that story, but to remind you of his interview and who he is, let's go to the interview. When did you come out and renounce racism? Because I know you did that in the past. 2019, several times in 2020, but whatever banner I might have been fighting under, the enemy had always been the same, left-wing radical, left-wing radicals, you know, socialist. But the Ku Klux Klan isn't against leftist radicals, they're against black people, Jews. What do you believe now that you didn't believe then? I guess it, um, it just depends on who's looking at it. When I've ever read anything like that, um, it seemed like they were just pro heritage. The Ku Klux Klan? But, well, in some forms, but I'm not here to defend them. It was 28 years ago, and I will not spend one more day from, I did this last year, no more apologies. But when I was looking at social media, you had put this picture here saying that Jovi Val was coming to speak at one of your rallies here. And then this is him, Jovi Val, with a racist and I mean, this is a Nazi hand gesture. And then he posted here, get in, we're hunting Juden. So he's talking about Jews. And that's him at your platform. Do you think that's someone who's a white supremacist? You know, I don't, I wouldn't call him a white supremacist. I think uh, Joby's got some issues. I didn't know he was that quite that extreme. We were but trying that to was find posted before speakers. you invited him. When you invited him and said you were bringing him here. He had already posted those things. Yeah, well, Joby was involved a lot with the MAGA. I wasn't aware of any of his other street activism. Street activism, you say? I call that regular ass racism. Yes, you all know each other and you all subscribe to the same ideology. Let's put up a picture of Mr. Chester Doyles back in his heyday. That's him, okay? He was qualifying to run for public office in Georgia. In order to do so, it requires candidates to sign a declaration of candidacy and affidavit. That means a sworn statement. That piece of paper has been the focus of an ongoing CBS 46 News investigation that has now exposed two convicted felons who attempted to run for office in the state, 61 year old Chester Doyles is a former leader of the Ku Klux Clowns. He also spent time in federal prison for gun charges and before that beating a black man in Maryland. Good old KKK Chester filed his affidavit, all right? He filed his affidavit, it was March 8th to qualify to run for Lumpkin County Board of Commissioners District 3, state of Georgia. CBS 46 News received the signed document from the county when they confirmed that he did in fact qualify. But after CBS 46 started asking questions of local and state election officials, Doles was disqualified. The Georgia Republican Party confirmed they started looking into it after the local news station brought it to their attention. So why was he disqualified? According to Georgia code written out on the declaration of candidacy and affidavit, felons can hold elected office in Georgia if they get their civil rights restored. And if at least 10 years have passed from the time they completed their last prison sentence. It has been over 10 years since he was released from prison. But according to the Georgia Republican Party, his rights were not restored in time for the qualifying deadline. Now that poses a question because that means he lied, which was March 8th. In the beginning of the year, the first month, Doles told CBS 46 investigator Rachel Polanski 
that they had but wouldn't provide any documentation. He said, hey, I have now been cleared. I have everything restored. That is what he said on the record. You were requesting a judge restore all your rights, including running for office. Has that happened? Rachel questioned Doles in February. That matter's been resolved, it's been cleared, I'm good to go. He responded a month later after he was disqualified, his answer changed. You had told me when we first talked that your rights had been restored by a judge. So that wasn't the case, Polanski asked. Well, I was asking and it was not in the judge's authority. He said it's not that he doesn't want to do it, he just lacks the authority. So that was the start and I've also filed with other departments and I'm gonna leave it right there, he claimed. Now here's the other side of the coin here. He just admitted he knew his voting rights and his right to run had not been restored. He just admitted that in that interview. When he signed the affidavit, he proclaimed that everything in the statement he made was absolutely true based on his knowledge. He just admitted to lying in a sworn affidavit. Here's my question, I get it, he doesn't qualify. And he never should have qualified to run for elected, elected office. But will the state of Georgia through the Republican elected Secretary of State, his name is Raffensperger, will he now file charges against that former KKK leader? Because that KKK leader has broken the law and he has admitted he knew he was breaking the damn law when he did it. He knew for sure there was absolutely nothing restored about his ability to participate as a candidate in the election. But he swore on an affidavit that it was. Now while the Georgia Republican Party is getting some semblance of praise from people who say way to go Georgia Republican Party for saying no to a known damn Klan's member. I say it doesn't go far enough because this man not only committed a crime in his affidavit, but if he has voted, he has also committed voter fraud. Now remember, right here on Indisputable, we just covered a story of a woman who was given clearance in writing that she was able to run for political office. Well, she got six years in prison. It has now been overturned, but she initially got six years in prison. A black woman, a black lives matter activist, and the government gave her clearance that was in writing. The judge said she manipulated the government, manipulated the probation office into doing that. This man has nothing stating that he was allowed to do this. Where's his penalty? Jordan thoughts. Well, I think it's a good point. Um, the what is the party doing here? And I, I would discourage people from celebrating the Georgia Republicans from from getting this guy out. But it seemed to be just on a technicality. It wasn't right. like they put out all the stops to to block him because of his clearly hateful views. And I want to remind people, even though he said in the interview, "Oh, I've changed this and that," the enemy has always been radical leftists. That's still a core component of KKK ideology. Uh, it was it, it beyond. Uh, I mean, obvi obviously, their first target was was Black Americans, but beyond that, it was it was also Jews, just like so many other hate groups, and it was socialists and communists. And ultimately, their enemy is any sort of intersectional cooperative movement, because that would pose a threat to what they see uh, as a as a uh, potentially or perceived, uh, you know, marginalized white uh, populace, which isn't true. It's rooted in hate. That's right. So it's good that he's out. He should have never been included or never been eligible or even close to this uh, this position in the first place. But also, I want people to think about why he saw the Republican Party as a vehicle for this candidacy. What what about the Republican Party uh, made him feel like that's how he should run and that's the party in which he should run? And you know, you could you could probably infer that based on their tepid response to him and hanging it up on a technicality. It's that they recognize that hate groups and hateful people in America are part of their voting base and they don't want to turn these people off. That's right, you make a great point and let me highlight something that's part of qualifying as a county commissioner in the state of Georgia. In order to qualify as a county commissioner, that person 
must go through, they would like to run as a Democrat or Republican, they must go through the county party system. So the county Republican party confirms individuals who would like to run on the Republican ticket. They also have the right to say no. And they can give any reason they choose as long as it's not because of a protected classification issue. They can just say no. We do not support your candidacy. The Republican Party was not strong enough to do that. They decided to hang their hat on a technicality to try to get him out of contention. White woman, there's a white woman so full of damn hate that she sees a Black Lives Matter sign in somebody else's yard. She gets out of her car and she does this. Let's go to the picture. This person is full of hate, look at her. That's called theft, that's called criminal trespass. This woman was so bold that she decided to basically pose for the camera at the residential property. This happened in North Carolina, a white woman is now subject to a criminal investigation after she stole a Black Lives Matter sign off another person's front porch. According to the local news affiliate, an unidentified woman trespassed on Melanie Larkey's property with the sole aim of removing the sign from her yard on Friday, March 11th around 1.30 PM. The ginger haired woman got out of a black sedan and marched up to the grass and grabbed the sign. Before pulling up the sign, she waved at the camera. Then she retreated back to the car. The homeowner was in her house during the crime, but did not know anything was happening at the time. It was not until she reviewed her camera's footage that she became aware of the violation. Um, Let's put up a picture of the homeowner. Her name is Melanie, okay, that's the homeowner. Melanie said when asked how she felt, she said surprised and unsettled are going to be the two words I'm going to use. It was really unnerving. Uh, Let me show you more pictures from the crime, okay? That is the front yard of a woman who cares about black lives. That picture shows another woman who does not give a damn about black lives. Ms. Larkey recounted, she said her abrasiveness and walking into my yard and stealing something that did not belong to her. Then she even waved at the camera and then made some distasteful remarks. When she got back to the car, she was in the hate. Is unreal. So let's analyze this, all right? Let's be very clear. The person who grabbed that sign is a Trump supporter. I put my money on that. I don't know her political ideology based on some kind of voting history. I know it based on her behavior. That woman supports Donald Trump. There's a real connection there. Also, this is the same person, I guarantee you, who will say things like, we just want America to be free. Really, isn't that something? You simply want people to have freedom. That's what this whole thing is about. Remember, they utilize that justification to do things like storm the US Capitol, impede the process of a constitutionally mandated dynamic, and also, yep, even engage in criminality. But they say, well, this is all about choice in America. We want choice. Everyone will agree. That going into a person's yard and stealing off of their property is wrong, it's illegal. Now, I gotta bring it out because what if the homeowner would have put some bullets in that body? Hmm? What if the homeowner felt threatened? What if the homeowner came out and said, stop, and the person did not, and then they shot this woman? Do you think those on the right will say things like, Well, you all have the right to bear arms. And in this case, we're glad that somebody was able to defend their property. Hail to the no. The reason is because they would have supported the woman who got shot in my make believe scenario because they support stealing Black Lives Matter signs. There's more. The community of Star Mount in South Charlotte, North Carolina, Boast approximately 2,800 people through its two zip codes. 
a predominantly Hispanic and white neighborhood. Less than 7% of the people that live in the area identify as African American. That's according to citydata.com reports. Larkey believes the sign and conversations about race should not seem provocative. In fact, because of the lack of diversity within the area, it could serve as an educational tool. Larkey remarked, I can't figure out what it is about my sign that says Black Lives Matter so upsetting to other people. It has shown me and a lot of the other neighbors have mentioned it too, that we need a discussion about race. Race and racial discussions in this country should not be provocative. They should not, they should be out in the open. People should be able to have a conversation about it. All right, so the police are still investigating. Um, but listen, we've covered things like this before with even more damaging impact. I want to remind you, put up uh, the pictures. I want to remind you over the last two years, activists, supporters, allies with Black Lives Matter signs, they have been targeted. They have been targeted for harassment, intimidation, and hate crimes. We reported on the Minnesota white man who harassed an interracial family back in July of 2021 over their yard sign and their very existence. He ended up ramming his SUV into the front of their home, running away, leaving behind a teddy bear hanging from a noose inside of the SUV, put up a picture of that criminal. His name is Benton Byers. Leading up to this incident, Benton Byers had reportedly been stalking the family. They contacted the police, the police did absolutely nothing. After this happened, which was an attempted murder, he was never charged with attempted murder. Instead, that guy, Benton Byers, was charged with 11 criminal counts, including two counts of second degree assault, two counts of stalking, and one count of first degree property damage. But he had been terrorizing that family for months and the cops did nothing until the family almost died. Now you have to understand how deep the hate runs for people who are simply driving down the street, supposedly minding their own business and a yard sign that says BLM or Black Lives Matter will cause them to immediately engage in criminal conduct. They have been radicalized, they are domestic terrorists. That is what they are. Jordan, what are your thoughts here? When I first saw this clip, I was appalled at just how entitled this woman was. Just marching up uh, onto the yard, taking the sign and waving to the camera. And I, I'm I, one of my guilty pleasures on YouTube is watching like people pranking uh, package, like porch package thieves. I don't know if you've seen these videos. Yeah, and even them. in those, they're not even like as emboldened. They're just like, they're kind of sneak up, they run away. This lady just walked up, took the sign, waved and, and stormed off. And it just, it really shocked me just how you know entitled she felt to, she felt to take someone else's property, to, uh, to walk onto their lawn and what this ultimately says about her. And only to the privilege does equality feel like uh, inequity. That is, you know, this is somebody who is a perceived under a perceived attack, and those fears are stoked by right wing media, and it underscores, you know, the importance of shows like this. That you know, you talk about these things and you you bring these stories to the public because you're not going to see these uh, most other places. And at the same time, there's this right wing effort to block these types of discussions in classrooms. You know, right. racism and hate is is a learned behavior. I like to think that, you know, there's it's not inherent in all people. And having these discussions in classrooms about this type of behavior I think is important, but the right wants to shut those down too. And that is because over time politics in this country has shifted where the singling out, the targeting, the harassment, the ridicule of our perceived enemy is an effective political strategy. So that's why, in part, why the right is fueling these bogus hysterias like critical race theory. That's right. Yeah, very well said. They are making fake policies and saying this is the new boogeyman. A man says, I can't breathe. We now have the video. He dies because the police did not believe him. Here's the video. Yeah. 
You're bringing the fight to this, not us. I'm not fighting it at all. I then have a seat and provide your arm. This is your last opportunity. Otherwise, you're going face down on the mat, and we're going to keep on going. Resisting. Let me breathe. 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 Stop moving. I can't breathe. The more you move, the worse it's going to be, bro. I can't breathe. 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 Hey, what's up? You got a syringe? Sure, you got a pulse on him. Edward. Pull his head, lift his head up. Get his airway open. Edward. Edward. They killed him. They killed him, and there was an attempt to cover that video up. But we have the video now. Let's put up a picture of Mr. Edwin, uh, Edward Bronstein. He should be alive today. That's Edward with his daughter Isabella. His death happened about two months before George Floyd's murder at the hands of Derek Chauvin and other cops. Bronstein's family is now suing over the 2020 death. They have called for charges against these officers and I joined them in this. Now, I know some will comment on this when we put it on social media and say things like, well, doc, he's not black. And he should be alive, he's dead, he's a human being. My dear brother, Ben Jealous was on my show not too long ago and we discussed two dynamics. We discussed what's called the racial bias index of police officers and the aggression index of police officers. And he has some interesting research that he cites. And he talks about how if a cop has a low racial bias index, but a high aggression index, situations like that will still happen. There's still a problem in the culture. When you have a cop that has a high racial bias index and a high aggression index, you have disaster happening damn near every day. It is still part of the culture that we must eradicate in this country. Let me give you some background to this story, here are the details. Um, Edward Bronstein was 38 years of age, he died March 31st, 2020. After the California Highway Patrol sought to take a blood sample following a traffic stop for allegedly driving under the influence, according to lawyers of the family and court documents. The family has now filed a wrongful death lawsuit in December 2020, but they also want LA County DA to file criminal charges against the officers. The wrongful death lawsuit alleges officers used excessive force and did not pursue medical care in a timely fashion. I agree, they did not. The family attorney, Michael Corillo said, and I quote, not one, not one officer took the action to pull the others off of him. Pull him to the side or something to give him air. When they finally flip him over, he's lifeless. Now. Let's go to the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner. The LA County Medical Examiner's Office, they ruled Bronstein's cause of death as acute methamphetamine intoxication. 
during a restraint by law enforcement. What in the hell kind of conclusion is that? Is it homicide or not? And the matter is unknown. You're the damn medical examiner. This is unknown to you? According to online records and court documents filed by the state opposing the release of the video at this time, they are still, they were still opposing the release of the video. It is an obvious attempted cover up. Let's put up a picture of the LA County DA. A spokesperson from the DA's office said that the matter still remains under review. Um, CHP Commissioner Amanda Ray, let's put up a picture of Commissioner Ray, California Highway Patrol, all right? They have declined to comment. Lawyers representing the California Highway Patrol and the officers in court filings have denied any unconstitutional or other types of wrong conduct and said they were performing their official duties impartially and fairly. Where is the common damn humanity? If somebody says I can't breathe, damn, believe them. If somebody says I can't breathe, breathing is important. Why is it? You have to ask this question. All of these cops, not one person tapped somebody on the shoulder and said, hey, back up a little bit, give him a little room. And here's the other side of this. It only takes one person who actually values humanity to change that whole situation. If one cop would have said, hey guys, let's back up for a minute. And that empowers you. Every single one of you that will see this segment, you are empowered in ways just like that. It only takes one person. If one cop would have said, just back away from him, he will be alive. He will be with his daughter, Isabella. He would not be a dead man today, and I would not be doing this segment about him. Jordan, what are your thoughts on this case? I think you're exactly right. This reflects a collective disregard for humanity. If you know somebody just recognized his pleas, and, and intervened, he would be alive. And this isn't the first time, sadly, that we've we've seen incidents like this. George Floyd and Eric Garner, like these are the same sorts of incidents where the cops just refused to stop restricting uh, airflow. It's it's sadistic and it's cruel. And part of it's the training, it's this really hyper aggressive police training that they receive where everybody's an enemy, death is lurking around every corner. And just a fundamental disregard for a core component of what like community policing should be is just to protect and serve. That's never been the case. This is you know the system working as it's really designed. And when you continue continue funding them, especially the more militaristic aspects, this is the result you're going to get. But what, while people might try to split hairs over semantics and oh well, was he resisting? Was he being aggressive? Look. The fact of the matter is, no matter what you're accused of, the punishment is never being killed on the spot by right. police, period, ever. It should never happen, but sadly it does time and time and time again. And people will find new excuses to make to justify these unjust deaths. Yeah, you have the right to due process in this country. Cops should try it. We got more on the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. Welcome back, we got a lot of show left. Let me read some of these comments, only have time for a couple. Uh, let's go to C3339409, Karen down, Karen down, Karen in distress. I repeat, Karen in distress, yep. Gazelle, now you paid 2000 just to get a cot in a jail. Yeah, that's basically the summary of it. Okay, uh, surrender to the flow, uh, this guy started screaming and my dog just got up and backed out of the room, <laughs> $2,000. Okay, very disturbing. A police officer has now claimed that not only is there racism in his police department, but also they were talking about starting a race war. I kid you not, a cop has now sued over racist text messages with coworkers. In a series of text messages, a white supervisor and other police officers in Montgomery County talked about preparing for a race war and expressing they hoped that Black Lives Matter protesters 
would actually be killed. That's according to a federal lawsuit filed by a black colleague. Let me give you details about this tragedy. Mark Miles of Maryland National Capital Park Police is filing a lawsuit against officers who sent him racist and abusive messages, reported the daily record. The suit claims the officer spoke in a group chat about triggering a race war with mentions toward far right extremist groups. Miles joined the police division back in April 2020, becoming the only black officer on his shift. The lawsuit said those involved were other officers on his shift and a supervisor who often made his race a subject of conversation. Now, here's why it's important to understand the dynamic of this being a shift thing, okay? Remember, culture matters, culture matters. That shift is all white, that shift is a white culture shift. That working group, that working group gets one black person in it and what happens? Well. He's in receipt of racist text messages. There's a reason why. The complaint alleges that Miles supervisor in shift five, Sergeant Stephanie Harvey told Miles that other officers in the squad, they were, well, they were worried they just couldn't trust him because of his race. Harvey told Miles that she'd informed the officers that he was actually half white and half black. You just have Negro to us. We'll tell them the other side is white, that'll do it. As soon as he was added to the group, Harvey allegedly sent a photo of a black child that said, well, hello, MFers. <laughs> On another occasion, Harvey texted the group, they want a race war, okay, let's go. Miles, you're on our side, at least half of you is. <laughs> and you know they did that white laugh at the end, like obviously this should just be funny. Let's, let's joke about killing black people. We've already, we already want to say the man is half white just to allow him entry into our white only police club. It gets deeper, Harvey did not stop there. This police supervisor, according to the complaint, also proudly proclaimed herself as a racist. You don't say, misogynistic and homophobic. Then she went further to suggest it was time to start killing Black Lives Matter protesters to kick off a civil war. Another officer responded back, Boogaloo is coming, referring to a far right extremist movement. Per the shift, Harvey was also alleged to be dismissive of racial bias training and claimed racism was just all made up. Once Miles reported these messages to another supervisor outside of that shift, what happened? They retaliated instead of looking into the issue. Miles was removed from the group chat, excluded from work events. And even when he called for backup at a high risk stop, no one showed up. You really think this is about policing? The lawsuit calls for Harvey to be fired and for the department to monitor employment complaints of misconduct to make sure no one has to go through what Miles did. Miles is also seeking compensation for the physical and emotional distress, humiliation and embarrassment he endured, reported WTOP News. Let me show you a picture of the division chief. Yeah, didn't expect that, did you? That's the division chief, his name is Stanley Johnson. He oversees that department. What has Stanley done? Not a damn thing. Why hasn't he? Maybe he's afraid. Maybe Stanley is just as much of a coward as the cops under him. Maybe Stanley, instead of trying to fight evil and fight white supremacy and fight these insane assaults against citizens, maybe he just wants to figure out how he fits in. Put up his picture again. I'm so damn disappointed in this black man. Yeah, he's the problem too. Stanley is the problem too. Instead of standing up and making the community proud he comes from, he decides to simply manage the dysfunction under him. Keep it out of the headlines. Jordan thoughts.
So doc, you mentioned this was in Montgomery County, Maryland, and I want yep. people to understand the demographics of that country, uh, that, that county. That county in Maryland is just north of DC and home to three of the top 10 most diverse cities in the country. It is a robustly diverse county. And look, it is it is a problem when there are racist officers anywhere, period. What's even more alarming is when you have them in a very diverse area, like they're not gonna be able, it's it's much harder for them to act out on their racist violent fantasies in a you know mostly white rural part of the country, thankfully. But in Montgomery County, that's extremely dangerous because of how diverse it is. So I worry about the people who live there, that that is the people who are purportedly keeping them safe. And again, it is it is an issue when there are racist officers anywhere. And there is a huge problem with that that have, has totally gone unaddressed. Part of that is because of how police unions function and how they retaliate against anybody who even tries to speak up. Yep. It has led to you know very uh, tragic outcomes like with uh, Dorner in California who tried to raise internal concerns about racism in his own department and that they harassed and belittled and ostracized him and that ended up in a very tragic outcome. But when going up the chain of command, whether in the military or the police, so rarely works that we have to have a different sort of system. And part of that is taking on the police unions. Yeah, and you got to think about how systemic and how ingrained racism was in the culture of this police department. Before the officer was allowed to work on that shift, they already had a plan to soften who he was because they obviously have a thing against black people. And it's so sad, and I got words for him too, it's so sad that he decided to play along with that madness because that doesn't help anybody win. That doesn't help the community he's from win. That doesn't help the citizens that are under the authority of that insane leadership of their police department win. And it doesn't help the racist person win either. Because left unchecked, that continues to permeate our culture and they do not have an opportunity for reflection. Racism exists on a spectrum. There are some people who are racist who can be saved. There are some who cannot. But they never get that opportunity if we continue to coexist in spaces where we are afraid to challenge them, afraid to speak up, trying to simply fit into their master plan rather than disrupt it. What are your thoughts on that, Jordan? Absolutely, it is, it's extremely troubling. I. I, I feel bad for this guy who seemed like he had altruistic purposes and, and, and motives for even joining. And this is what he he dealt with. I mean, police unions, how they look out for one another, how they cover for one another, how they have multiple days to get their story straight when yeah. get their story straight when there's reports of, of wrongdoing. It's a system that has to be changed. That they shouldn't be able to investigate themselves and then say, oh, we did nothing wrong. Surprise. Uh, yeah, well said. Pat Robertson, what can I say? Let's just go to the video. We have the firepower to wipe out every Russian city, just one Trident submarine. And of course, we're not using it and have no intention of using it. But why doesn't somebody in the administration call Putin's bluff? He's bluffing. And every time he says, well, if you do that, we're going to escalate. Oh No, you're not, old buddy, we're gonna do you. If you try to do us, we will make it worse and you know it. Putin knows we were powerful, he doesn't have much of, a, of an army, he doesn't have much of an economy. It's a tiny economy and he's playing a bluff. But unfortunately, we have a man in charge in Washington who doesn't like to stand up to bluffs. He folds his winning hand every single time. White Jesus is a hell of a drug. How in the hell is Pat Robertson still alive? Okay, let's go ahead and do it. Uh, Pat Robertson, who by the way, was a hardcore Trump supporter. I mean, this guy bent all, kind, all kinds of rules on his TV station, 
on his TV network in order to support Donald Trump and all of his insanity. Now he wants the American government to engage in a nuclear fight with Russia. Now why is he saying this? Maybe because he's closer out the door than in it. But I want American lives to remain intact. Because if we go to war, that means there's a calculation in America of soldiers who will die. Young soldiers who will be killed. They will give their lives in that scenario. Well, obviously, Pat Robertson does not care. He previously tipped his hand back in February when he was all giddy about possibly going to war with Russia. Here it is. I think you can say, well, Putin's out of his mind. Yes, maybe so. But at the same time, he's being compelled by God. He went into the Ukraine, but that wasn't his goal. His goal was to move against Israel ultimately. God is getting ready to do something amazing, and that will be fulfilled. And what Putin is doing by moving as he is to set up Ukraine as a, as a staging ground for one of the armies, and then across is, is Erdogan at Turkey, and, and you've got between them that little Dardanelles area, and it's going to happen. So I just say, that is what's coming up. Is Putin crazy? Is he mad? Well, perhaps. But God says, I'm going to put hooks in your jaws and I'm going to draw you into this battle, whether you like it or not. And he's being compelled after the move into the Ukraine, he's being compelled to move again to get a land bridge and then across the Dardanelles with Turkey and watch what's going to happen next. You read your Bible because it's coming to pass. Pat, I'm a Christian man myself. God gave me a brain before he gave me a book. You need to sit your ass down. This is, you literally have a Christian pastor who people actually listen to, continuing to call for warfare. This is not the first time he has called for the assassination of other leaders. He has called for warfare in other conflict. He has been wrong on his prophecy many times. He simply gets a pass because let's face it, religion is the best hustle in this country. Jordan thoughts. Look, this will come as no surprise to anyone, but Pat Robertson has no idea what he's talking about. And it's important to remember that any increased escalation with Putin and Russia and the Russian military will be fought mostly in Ukraine. It will we will not be affected. We'll send people there, but the the battles, the bombs, the cluster munitions, the things that are wreaking havoc on people's lives will not be here. And it's very easy for a right-wing, you know, Christ, Christo fascist leader to suggest that we should do this so we should escalate tensions with a nuclear power. We should wage war with them because they're completely insulated from the consequences. It's very easy for people in privileged positions to call for these horrific acts of human violence and atrocity when they know they won't face any blowback. So yep. this is, you know, we see this throughout the right, but it's it's extremely troubling as these continues, as these calls for war continue to grow. Yep, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable. Stick and stay. Welcome back, we got a lot of show left. Let me read some of these comments, only have time for a couple. Uh, Let's go to C3339409, Karen down, Karen down, Karen in distress, I repeat, Karen in distress. Yep, Gazelle, now you paid 2000 just to get a cot in a jail. Yeah, that's basically the summary of it. Okay, uh, surrender to the flow, Uh, this guy started screaming and my dog just got up and backed out of the room, <laughs> $2,000. Okay, Trump supporters now believe that Trump, Putin and Xi Jinping are all somehow trying to save the world from the deep state. Here it is. You can take a gun, shoot somebody in the face, it's not hard. Sometimes it might even be fun if they're a godless commie. Now 
what they're trying to do is sneak the COVID vaccine in your salads. I never had, I hate math. Somebody say amen. I got a good idea what's going on in Ukraine. When they went into Ukraine and they found these labs, they believe that maybe that the deep state is possibly going to use a bioweapon on Russian people. Because they've been just like they were collecting our DNA in China, they've been collecting their DNA as well. So Trump and Putin right now are the only ones successfully fighting against the deep state. Well, I think as well as D- Xi too. Who? Xi. Oh, she, Xi Jinping? Mm-hmm. So Xi Jinping is oh, fighting well, against he's, the... He's, he's a good guy. Oh, so he, oh, he's fighting against he's, the... Why? Because think about it. He's not part of the CCP. But Xi Jinping, do you think he's working with Putin and Trump against the deep state? I think he probably is, yeah. Probably. I've heard that. Yeah. I mean, I've heard Xi that. Xi Jinping is working against yeah. the deep and state. Modi? Modi also Modi. in India. Yeah, I've heard that. Xi Jinping, Modi, Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump mm-hmm. are all working against the deep state. Right, and then you've got the White Hat Alliance, which is a lot of countries, you know, Canada, uh, France. He is part of the good guys. The reason I think that is because he's fixing to go into Taiwan. You wait and see what I tell you. When he gets into Taiwan, guess what he's going to find? More More labs. More bio labs. That is all planned out, y'all. It's all planned. This is one big sting operation. That's what I believe. Yeah, so Xi Jinping... Putin, Putin and Trump That's are right. the only ones fighting uh, against the deep state and making sure that there are no bioweapons to That's be released. That's right, yeah. because if they do not stop them, they will release them. And next time, it'll be far worse than any fake coronavirus. Wow. It's all been planned out, y'all. Um, you know, on a serious note, uh, Trump did say, He loves the poorly educated. He said that, loves them. They manipulate individuals who have a low independence threshold, the inability to think critically about the reality that's in front of them. They like to spoon feed information and control the methodology and how they receive it. What happens when you are constantly spoon fed information that's contrary to truth, that right there. The people you just saw were designed by a massive intentional political manipulation to guard them from actual truth. Jordan, I give you the last words on this. I don't know if I can make sense of what I just saw. And you shouldn't even try, <laughs> it was, brother. <laughs> it was incoherent. I mean, they've just to- totally done a 180 on people that they previously, you know, hated. Like Xi Jinping was, you know, almost public enemy number one for the Trump administration, and they really wanted to ratchet up tensions with China. And now all of a sudden, he's our ally. I'm floored. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The, the bio, the bioweapons labs is just like a totally like off the wall conspiracy theory that I think a lot of fringe groups have been pushing. Um, but at the end of the day, all this, these types of, you know, conspiracies and talking points, just cover for the atrocities that are happening daily in Ukraine. And it just, it breaks my heart to see it, as I know it does yours. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's really, really disgusting that this is something that people believe. Yeah, and that ridiculous um, bio lab conspiracy came from Russia, echoed by China, adopted by people like Gabbard and others. Uh, so you're gonna see this continue, it has not stopped. If you could brother, give us how people can follow you, check out your great work, always a pleasure having you. Appreciate it, thank you for having me. Uh, videos are on Rebel HQ on YouTube and Deep Dive airs Tuesdays and Thursdays on twitch.tv slash TYT. Thank you, my friend. All right, remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember the truth is always, indisputable. Welcome to Indisputable. I'm your host, Dr. Rashad Richard. We got a lot happening today. But what do we do on this show? We tell the truth. You know why we tell the truth? Because the truth is simply indisputable. Rashad, great to be here. Congratulations on the new show. And I gotta let everybody know that Rashad and I go way back. People still need health care, so I won't stop. People still need criminal justice systems reform throughout this country, so I won't stop. And you won't stop either.